The midnight tried of Paul Revere happened a long time ago when this country was ruled by the King of England. There were thousands of English soldiers in Boston. The king had sent them there to make the people obey his unjust laws. These soldiers guarded the streets of the town. They would not let anyone go out or come in without their leave. The people did not like this. They said, we have a right to be free men, but the king treats us as slaves. He makes us pay taxes and gives us nothing in return. He sends soldiers among us to take away our liberty. The whole country was stirred up. Brave men left their homes and hurried toward Boston. They said, we do not wish to fight against the king, but we are free men, and he must not send soldiers to oppress us. If the people of Boston must fight for their liberty, we will help them. These men were not afraid of the king's soldiers. Some of them camped in Charlestown, a village near Boston. From the hills of Charlestown they could watch and see what the king's soldiers were doing. They wished to be ready to defend themselves if the soldiers should try to do them harm. For this reason they had bought some powder and stored it at Concord, nearly twenty miles away. When the king's soldiers heard about this powder, they made up their minds to go out and get it for themselves. Among the watchers at Charlestown was a brave young man named Paul Revere. He was ready to serve his country in any way that he could. One day a friend of his who lived in Boston came to see him. He came very quietly and secretly to escape the soldiers. I have something to tell you, he said. Some of the king's soldiers are going to Concord to get the powder that is there. They are getting ready to start this very night. Indeed, said Paul Revere, they shall get no powder if I can help it. I will stir up all the farmers between here and Concord, and those fellows will have a hot time of it. But you must help me. I will do all that I can, said his friend. Well then, said Paul Revere, you must go back to Boston and watch. Watch. And as soon as the soldiers are ready to start, hang a lantern in the tower of the Old North Church. If they are to cross the river, hand to. I will be here, ready. As soon as I see the light, I will mount my horse and ride out to give the alarm. And so it was done. When night came, Paul Revere was at the riverside with his horse. He looked over toward Boston. He knew where the old North Church stood, but he could not see much in the darkness. Hour after hour he stood and watched. The town seemed very still, but now and then he could hear the beating of a drum or the shouting of some soldier. The moon rose, and by its light he could see the dim form of the church tower. Far away, he heard the clock strike ten. He waited and watched. The clock struck eleven. He was beginning to feel tired. Perhaps the soldiers had given up their plan. He walked up and down the river bank, leading his horse behind him, but he kept his eyes turned always toward the dim, dark spot which he knew was the old North Church. All at once a light flashed out from the tower. Ah, there it is, he cried. The soldiers had started. He spoke to his horse. He put his foot in the stirrup. He was ready to mount. Then another light flashed clear and bright by the side of the first one. The soldiers would cross the river. Paul Revere sprang into the saddle. Like a bird let loose, his horse leaped forward. 
away they went. Away they went through the village street and out upon the country road. Up, up, shouted Paul Revere. The soldiers are coming. Up, up, and defend yourselves. The cry awoke the farmers. They sprang from their beds and looked out. They could not see the speeding horse, but they heard the clatter of its hoofs far down the road, and they understood the cry, up, up, and defend yourselves. It is the alarm. The redcoats are coming, they said to each other. Then they took their guns, their axes, anything they could find, and hurried out. So through the night, Paul Revere rode toward Concord. At every farmhouse and every village he repeated his call. The alarm quickly spread. Guns were fired. Bells were rung. The people for miles around were roused as though a fire were raging. The king's soldiers were surprised to find everybody awake along the road. They were angry because their plans had been discovered. When they reached Concord, they burned the courthouse there. At Lexington, not far from Concord, there was a sharp fight in which several men were killed. This, in history, is called the Battle of Lexington. It was the beginning of the war called the Revolutionary War. But the king's soldiers did not find the gunpowder. They were glad enough to march back without it. All along the road the farmers were waiting for them. It seemed as if every man in the country was after them, and they did not feel themselves safe until they were once more in Boston. A blacksmith was showing a horse. Shoe him quickly, for the king wishes to ride him to battle, said the groom who had brought him. Do you think there will be a battle? asked the blacksmith. Most certainly, and very soon, too, answered the man. The king's enemies are even now advancing, and all are ready for the fight. Today, will decide whether Richard or Henry shall be king of England. The smith went on with his work. From a bar of iron he made four horseshoes. These he hammered and shaped and fitted to the horse's feet. Then he began to nail them on. But after he had nailed on two shoes, he found that he had not nails enough for the other two. I have only six nails. He said, and it will take a little time to hammer out ten more. Oh, well, said the groom, won't six nails do? Put three in each shoe. I hear the trumpets now. King Richard will be impatient. Three nails in each shoe will hold them on, said the smith. Yes, I think we may risk it. So he quickly finished the showing and the groom hurried to lead the horse to the king. The battle had been raging for some time. King Richard rode hither and thither, cheering his men and fighting his foes. His enemy, Henry, who wished to be king, was pressing him hard. Far away, at the other side of the field, King Richard saw his men falling back. Without his help, they would soon be beaten. So he spurred his horse to ride to their aid. He was hardly halfway across the stony field when one of the horse's shoes flew off. The horse was lamed on a rock. Then another shoe came off. The horse stumbled, and his rider was thrown heavily to the ground. Before the king could rise, his frightened horse, although lame, had galloped away. The king looked and saw that his soldiers were beaten and that the battle was everywhere going against him. He waved his sword in the air. 
he shouted, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. But there was no horse for him. His soldiers were intent on saving themselves. They could not give him any help. The battle was lost. King Richard was lost. Henry became king of England. For the want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For the want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For the want of a horse, the bow was lost. For the failure of battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a horseshoe nail. Richard III was one of England's worst kings. Henry, the Duke of Richmond, made war upon him and defeated him in a great battle. When John Adams was president and Thomas Jefferson was vice president of the United States, there was not a railroad in all the world. People did not travel very much. There were no broad, smooth highways as there are now. The roads were crooked and muddy and rough. If a man was obliged to go from one city to another, he often rode on horseback. Instead of a trunk for his clothing, he carried a pair of saddle bags. Instead of sitting at his ease in a parlor car, he went jolting along through mud and mire, exposed to wind and weather. One day, some men were sitting by the door of a hotel in Baltimore. As they looked down the street, they saw a horseman coming. He was riding very slowly, and both he and his horse were best pattered with mud. There comes old Farmer Moss back, said one of the men, laughing. He's just in from the backwoods. He seems to have had a hard time of it said another. I wonder where he'll put up for the night. Oh, any kind of a place will suit him, answered the landlord. He's one of those country fellows who can sleep in the haymow and eat with the horses. The traveler was soon at the door. He was dressed plainly, and with his reddish-brown hair and mud-bespattered face, looked like a hard-working countryman just in from the backwoods. Have you a room here for me? He asked the landlord. Now the landlord prided himself upon keeping a first-class hotel, and he feared that his guests would not like the rough-looking traveler. So he answered, do no, sir. Every room is full. The only place I could put you would be in the barn. Well, then, answered the stranger, I will see what they can do for me at the planter's tavern round the corner, and he rode away. About an hour later, a well-dressed gentleman came into the hotel and said, I wish to see Mr. Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson, said the landlord. Yes, sir. Thomas Jefferson, the Vice President of the United States. He isn't here. Oh, but he must be. I met him as he rode into town, and he said that he intended to stop at this hotel. He has been here about an hour. No, he hasn't. The only man that has been here for lodging today was an old clodhopper who was so spattered with mud that you couldn't see the color of his coat. I sent him round to the planters. Did he have reddish-brown hair? And did he ride a gray horse? Yes, and he was quite tall. That was Mr. Jefferson, said the gentleman. Mr. Jefferson, cried the landlord was that the vice president here dick build a fire in the best room put everything in tip to porter sally what a dun sigh was to turn mr jefferson away he shall have all the rooms in the house and the ladies parlor too i'll go right round to the planters and fetch him back 
So he went to the other hotel, where he found the vice president sitting with some friends in the parlor. Mr. Jefferson, he said, I have come to ask your pardon. You were so best pattered with mud that I thought you were some mold farmer. If you'll come back to my house, you shall have the best room in it, yes. All the rooms if you wish. Won't you come? No, answered Mr. Jefferson. A farmer is as good as any other man. And where there's no room for a farmer, there can be no room for me. One morning, there was a loud knock at Dean Swift's door. The servant opened it. A man who was outside handed her a fine duck that had lately been killed and said, Here's a present for the dean. It's from Mr. Boyle. Then, without another word, he turned and walked away. A few days afterward, the man came again. This time, he brought a partridge. Here's another bird from Mr. Boyle. Now, Mr. Boyle was a sporting neighbor who spent a good deal of time in shooting. He was a great admirer of Dean Swift and took pleasure in sending him presents of game. The third time, the man brought a quail. Here's something else for the Dean, he said roughly, and tossed it into the servant's arms. The servant complained to her master. That fellow has no manners, she said. The next time he comes, said the dean, let me know, and I will go to the door. It was not long until the man came with another present. The dean went to the door. Here's a rabbit from Mr. Boyle, said the man. A lesson in manners image. See here said the dean in a stern voice. That is not the way to deliver a message here. Just step inside and make believe that you are Dean Swift. I will go out and make believe that I am bringing him a present. I will show you how a messenger ought to behave. I'll agree to that, said the man, and he stepped inside. The dean took the rabbit and went out of the house. He walked up the street to the next block. Then he came back and knocked gently at the door. The door was opened by the man from Mr. Boyle's. The dean bowed gracefully and said, If you please, sir, Mr. Boyle's compliments, and he wishes you to accept of this fine rabbit. Oh, thank you said the man very politely. Then, taking out his purse, he offered the dean a shilling, and here is something for your trouble. The lesson in manners was not forgotten, for always after that, the man was very polite when he brought his presents, and the dean also took the hint, for he always remembered to give the man a tip for his trouble. Jonathan Swift, often called Dean Swift, was famous as a writer on many subjects. Among other books, he wrote Gulliver's Travels, which you, perhaps, will read sometime. In Scotland, there once lived a poor shepherd whose name was James Hogg. His father and grandfather and great-grandfather had all been shepherds. It was his business to take care of the sheep, which belonged to a rich landholder by the Ettrick Water. Sometimes he had several hundreds of lambs to look after. He drove these to the pastures on the hills and watched them day after day while they fed on the short green grass. He had a dog which he called Syrah. This dog helped him watch the sheep. 
he would drive them from place to place as his master wished. Sometimes he would take care of the whole flock while the shepherd was resting or eating his dinner. One dark night, James Hag was on the hilltop with a flock of 700 lambs. Syra was with him. Suddenly a storm came up. There was thunder and lightning. The wind blew hard, the rain poured. The poor lambs were frightened. The shepherd and his dog could not keep them together. Some of them ran towards the east, some towards the west, and some towards the south. The shepherd soon lost sight of them in the darkness. With his lighted lantern in his hand, he went up and down the rough hills calling for his lambs. Two or three other shepherds joined him in the search. All night long they sought for the lambs. Morning came and still they sought. They looked, as they thought, in every place where the lambs might have taken shelter. At last James Hogg said, It's of no use. All we can do is to go home and tell the master that we have lost his whole flock. They had walked a mile or two towards home when they came to the edge of a narrow and deep ravine. They looked down, and at the bottom they saw some lambs huddled together among the rocks. And there was Cyrus standing guard over them and looking all around for help these must be the lambs that rushed off towards the south, said James Hogg. The men hurried down and soon saw that the flock was a large one. I really believe they are all here, said one. They counted them and were surprised to find that not one lamb of the great flock of 700 was missing. How had Syrah managed to get the three scattered divisions together? How had he managed to drive all the frightened little animals into this place of safety? Nobody could answer these questions. But there was no shepherd in Scotland that could have done better than Syrah did that night. Long afterward, James Hogg said, I never felt so grateful to any creature below the sun as I did to Syrah that morning. When James Hogg was a boy, his parents were too poor to send him to school. By some means, however, he learned to read it, and after that he loved nothing so much as a good book. There were no libraries near him, and it was hard for him to get books. But he was anxious to learn. Whenever he could buy or borrow a volume of prose or verse, he carried it with him until he had read it through. While watching his flocks, he spent much of his time in reading. He loved poetry and soon began to write poems of his own. These poems were read and admired by many people. The name of James Hogg became known all over Scotland. He was often called the Ettrick Shepherd because he was the keeper of sheep near the Ettrick Water. Many of his poems are still read and loved by children as well as by grown-up men and women. Here is one. A boy's song. Where the pools are bright and deep. Where the great trout lies asleep. Up the river and nor the lee. That's the way for Billy and me. Where the blackbird sings the latest. Where the hawth or in blooms the sweetest where the nestlings chirp and flee. That's the way for Billy and me. Where the mowers mow the cleanest, where the hay lies thick and greenest, there to trace the homeward bee. That's the way for Billy and me. Where the hazel bank is steepest, where the shadow falls the deepest, where the clustering nuts fall free. That's the way for Billy and me. Why the boys should drive away, little maidens from their play, or love to banter and fight so well, 
That's the thing I never could tell. But this I know. I love to play in the meadow, among the hay, up the water, and nor the lee. That's the way for Billy and me. In France, there once lived a famous man who was known as the Marquis de Lafayette. When he was a little boy, his mother called him Gilbert. Gilbert de Lafayette, his father and grandfather and great-grandfather, had all been brave and noble men. He was very proud to think of this, and he wished that he might grow up to be like them. His home was in the country not far from a great forest. Often, when he was a little lad, he took long walks among the trees with his mother. Mother, he would say, do not be afraid. I am with you, and I will not let anything hurt you. One day word came that a savage wolf had been seen in the forest. Men said that it was a very large wolf, and that it had killed some of the farmer's sheep. How I should like to meet that wolf, said little Gilbert. He was only seven years old but now all his thoughts were about the savage beast that was in the forest. Shall we take a walk this morning? Asked his mother. Oh, yes, said Gilbert. Perhaps we may see that wolf among the trees, but don't be afraid. His mother smiled, for she felt quite sure that there was no danger. They did not go far into the woods. The mother sat down in the shade of a tree and began to read in a new book which she had bought the day before. The boy played on the grass nearby. The sun was warm. The bees were buzzing among the flowers. The small birds were singing softly. Gilbert looked up from his play and saw that his mother was very deeply interested in her book. Now for the wolf, he said to himself. He walked quickly, but very quietly down the pathway into the darker woods. He looked eagerly around, but saw only a squirrel frisking among the trees and a rabbit hopping across the road. Soon he came to a wilder place. There the bushes were very close together, and the pathway came to an end. He pushed the bushes aside and went a little farther. How still everything was. He could see a green open space just beyond and then the woods seemed to be thicker and darker. This is just a place for that wolf, he thought. Then, all at once, he heard footsteps. Something was pushing its way through the bushes. It was coming toward him. It's the wolf, I'm sure. It will not see me till it comes very near. Then I will jump out and throw my arms around its neck and choke it to death. The animal was coming nearer. He could hear its footsteps. He could hear its heavy breathing. He stood very still and waited. It will try to bite me, he thought. Perhaps it will scratch me with its sharp claws. But I will be brave. I will not cry out. I will choke it with my strong arms. Then I will drag it out of the bushes and call Mama to come and see it. The beast was very close to him now. He could see its shadow as he peeped out through the clusters of leaves. His breath came fast. He planted his feet firmly and made ready to spring. How proud Mamma will be of her brave boy. Ah, uh, there was a wolf. He saw its shaggy head and big round eyes. He leaped from his hiding place and clasped it round its neck. It did not try to bite or scratch. It did not even growl but it jumped quickly forward and threw Gilbert upon the ground. Then it ran out into the open space and stopped to gaze at him. Gilbert was soon on his feet again. He was not hurt at all. He looked at the beast, and what do you think it was? It was not a wolf. It was only a pet calf that had come there to browse among the bushes. The boy felt very much ashamed. He hurried back to the pathway and then ran to his mother, Tears were in his eyes, but he tried to look brave. Oh, Gilbert, where have you been? Said his mother. Then he told her all that had happened. His lips quivered and he began to cry. Never mind, my dear, said his mother. You were very brave, and it is lucky that the wolf was not there. You faced what you thought was a great danger, and you were not afraid. You are my hero. 
when the American people were fighting to free themselves from the rule of the King of England, the Marikita Lafayette helped them with men and money. He was a friend of Washington. His name is remembered in our country as that of a brave and noble man. One day in spring, four men were riding on horseback along a country road. These men were lawyers, and they were going to the next town to attend court. There had been a rain, and the ground was very soft. Water was dripping from the trees, and the grass was wet. The four lawyers rode along, one behind another, for the pathway was narrow, and the mud on each side of it was deep. They rode slowly, and talked and laughed and were very jolly. As they were passing through a grove of small trees, they heard a great fluttering over their heads and a feeble chirping in the grass by the roadside. Stiff, 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 came from the leafy branches above them. Cheap, 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 came from the wet grass. What is the matter here? asked the first lawyer, whose name was Speed. Oh, it's only some old robins, said the second lawyer whose name was Hardin. The storm has blown two of the little ones out of the nest. They are too young to fly, and the mother bird is making a great fuss about it. What a pity! They'll die down there in the grass, said the third lawyer, whose name I forget. Oh, well, they are nothing but birds, said Mr. Hardin. Why should we bother? Yes, why should we? said Mr. Speed. The three men, as they passed, looked down and saw the little birds fluttering in the cold, wet grass. They saw the mother robin flying about and crying to her mate. Then they rode on, talking and laughing as before. In a few minutes they had forgotten about the birds. But the fourth lawyer, whose name was Abraham Lincoln, stopped. He got down from his horse and very gently took the little ones up in his big warm hands. They did not seem frightened, but chirped softly, as if they knew they were safe. Never mind, my little fellows, said Mr. Lincoln, I will put you in your own cozy little bed. Then he looked up to find the nest from which they had fallen. It was high, much higher than he could reach. But Mr. Lincoln could climb. He had climbed many a tree when he was a boy. He put the birds softly, one by one, into their warm little home. Two other baby birds were there that had not fallen out, all cuddled down together and were very happy. Soon the three lawyers who had ridden ahead stopped at a spring to give their horses water. Where is Lincoln? asked one. All were surprised to find that he was not with them. Do you remember those birds? said Mr. Speed. Very likely he has stopped to take care of them. In a few minutes Mr. Lincoln joined them. His shoes were covered with mud. He had torn his coat on the thorny tree. Hello, Abraham, said Mr. Hardin. Where have you been? I stopped a minute to give those birds to their mother, he answered. Well, we always thought you were a hero, said Mr. Speed. Now we know it. Then all three of them laughed heartily. They thought it so foolish that a strong man should take so much trouble just for some worthless young birds. Gentlemen, said Mr. Lincoln, I could not have slept tonight if I had left those helpless little robins to perish in the wet grass. Abraham Lincoln afterwards became very famous as a lawyer and statesman. He was elected president. Next to Washington, he was the greatest American. Children, tomorrow I shall expect all of you to write compositions, said the teacher of Love Lane School. Then, on Friday, those who have done the best may stand up and read their compositions to the school. Some of the children were pleased, and some were not. What shall we write about? They asked. You may choose any subject that you like best, said the teacher. Some of them thought that home was a good subject. 
others liked school. One little boy chose the horse. A little girl said she would write about summer. The next day, every pupil except one had written a composition. Henry Longfellow said the teacher, why have you not written? Because I don't know how, answered Henry. He was only a child. Well, said the teacher, you can write words, can you not? Yes, sir, said the boy. After you have written three or four words, you can put them together, can you not? Yes, sir, I think so. Well, then, said the teacher, you may take your slate and go out behind the schoolhouse for half an hour. Think of something to write about and write the word on your slate. Then try to tell what it is, what it is like, what it is good for, and what is done with it. That is the way to write a composition. Henry took his slate and went out. Just behind the schoolhouse was Mr. Finney's barn. Quite close to the barn was a garden, and in the garden, Henry saw a turnip. Well, I know what that is, he said to himself, and he wrote the word turnip on his slate. Then he tried to tell what it was like, what it was good for, and what was done with it. Before the half hour was ended, he had written a very neat composition on his slate. He then went into the house and waited while the teacher read it. The teacher was surprised and pleased. He said, Henry Longfellow, you have done very well. Today you may stand up before the school and read what you have written about the turnip. Many years after that, some funny little verses about Mr. Finney's turnip were printed in a newspaper. Some people said that they were what Henry Longfellow wrote on his slate that day at school. But this was not true. Henry's composition was not in verse. As soon as it was read to the school, he rubbed it off the slate, and it was forgotten. Perhaps you would like to read those funny verses. Here they are, but you must never, never, never think that Henry Longfellow wrote them. Mr. Finney had a turnip, and it grew, and it grew, it grew behind the barn, and the turnip did no harm. And it grew, and it grew, till it could grow no taller. Then Mr. Finney took it up and put it in the cellar. There it lay. There it lay, till it began to rot. Then Susie Finney washed it and put it in a pot. She boiled it and boiled it as long as she was able. Then Miss Is Finney took it and put it on the table. Mr. Finney and his wife both sat down to sup, and they ate, and they ate. They ate the turnip up. All the school children in our country have heard of Henry W. Longfellow. He was the best loved of all our poets. He wrote the Village Blacksmith, The Children's Hour, and many other beautiful pieces which you will like to read and remember. Two hundred years ago there lived in Boston a little boy whose name was Benjamin Franklin. On the day that he was seven years old, his mother gave him a few pennies. He looked at the bright, yellow pieces and said, What shall I do with these coppers, mother? It was the first money that he had ever had. You may buy something. If you wish, said his mother, and then will you give me more? He asked. His mother shook her head and said, No, Benjamin, I cannot give you any more, so you must be careful not to spend these foolishly. The little fellow ran into the street. He heard the pen is jingle in his pocket. How rich he was! 
Boston is now a great city, but at that time it was only a little town. There were not many stores. As Benjamin ran down the street, he wondered what he should buy. Should he buy candy? He hardly knew how it tasted. Should he buy a pretty toy? If he had been the only child in the family, things might have been different. But there were fourteen boys and girls older than he, and two little sisters who were younger. What a big family it was, and the father was a poor man. No wonder the lad had never owned a toy. He had not gone far when he met a larger boy who was blowing a whistle. I wish I had that whistle, he said. The big boy looked at him and blew it again. Oh, what a pretty sound it made. I have some pennies said Benjamin. He held them in his hand and showed them to the boy. You may have them if you will give me the whistle. All of them. Yes, all of them. Well, it's a bargain, said the boy, and he gave the whistle to Benjamin and took the pennies. Little Benjamin Franklin was very happy for he was only seven years old. He ran home as fast as he could, blowing the whistle as he ran. See, mother, he said, I have bought a whistle. How much did you pay for it? All the pen is you gave me. Oh, Benjamin. One of his brothers asked to see the whistle. Well, well, he said. You've paid a dear price for this thing. It's only a penny whistle and a poor one at that. You might have bought half a dozen such whistles with the money I gave you, said his mother. The little boy saw what a mistake he had made. The whistle did not please him any more. He threw it upon the floor and began to cry. Never mind, my child, said his mother, very kindly. You are only a very little boy, and you will learn a great deal as you grow bigger. The lesson you have learned today is never to pay too dear for a whistle. Benjamin Franklin lived to be a very old man, but he never forgot that lesson. I should like to be a sailor, said George Washington. Then I could go to many strange lands and see many wonderful things. And by and by, I might become the captain of a ship. He was only 14 years old. His older brothers were quite willing that he should go to sea. They said that a bright boy like George would not long be a common sailor. He would soon become a captain and then perhaps a great admiral. And so the matter was at last settled. George's brothers knew the master of a trading ship who was getting ready to sail to England. He agreed to take the boy with him and teach him how to be a good sailor. George's mother was very sad. His uncle had written her a letter saying, do not let him go to sea. If he begins as a common sailor, he will never be anything else. But George had made up his mind to go. He was headstrong and determined. He would not listen to anyone who tried to persuade him to stay at home. At last the day came for the ship to sail. It was waiting in the river. A boat was at the landing ready to take him on board. The little chest that held his clothing had been carried down to the bank. George was in high glee at the thought of going. Goodbye, mother, he said. 
he stood on the doorstep and looked back into the house. He saw the kind faces of those whom he loved. He began to feel very sad. Goodbye, my dear boy. George saw the tears in his mother's eyes. He saw them rolling down her cheeks. He knew that she did not wish him to go. He could not bear to see her grief. He stood still for a moment, thinking. Then he turned quickly and said, Mother, I have changed my mind. I will stay at home and do as you wish. Then he called to the young boy, who was waiting at the door, and said, Tom, run down to the shore and tell them not to put the chest in the boat. Send word to the captain not to wait for me, for I have changed my mind. I am not going to see. Who has not heard of George Washington? It has been said of him that he was the first in war, the first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. He was our most famous president. He has been called the father of his country. Once upon a time, there was a famous Arab whose name was Almanser. He was the ruler of all the Arabs and was therefore called the Caliph. Almanser loved poetry and was fond of hearing poets repeat their own verses. Sometimes, if a poem was very pleasing, he gave the poet a prize. One day a poet whose name was Thalaby came to the Caliph and recited a long poem. When he had finished, he bowed and waited, hoping that he would be rewarded. Which would you rather have asked the Caliph? Three hundred pieces of gold or three wise sayings from my lips. The poet wished very much to please the Caliph. So he said, O oh, my master, everybody should choose wisdom rather than wealth. The Caliph smiled and said, Very well, then, listen to my first wise saying. When your coat is worn out, don't sew on a new patch, it will look ugly. Oh, dear, moaned the poet, there go a hundred gold pieces all at once. The Caliph smiled again. Then he said, Listen now to my second word of wisdom. It is this. When you oil your beard, don't toil it too much, lest it soil your clothing. Worse and worse. Grown the poor poet, there go the second hundred. What shall I do? Wait. And I will tell you, said the Caliph, and he smiled again. My third wise saying is, O Caliph, have mercy, cried the poet. Keep the third piece of wisdom for your own use, and let me have the gold. The Caliph laughed outright, and so did every one that heard him. Then he ordered his treasurer to pay the poet five hundred pieces of gold. For, indeed, the poem which he had recited was wonderfully fine. The Caliph, Almanser, lived nearly twelve hundred years ago. He was the builder of a famous and beautiful city called Baghdad. Thousands of years ago, the greatest country in the world was Egypt. It was a beautiful land lying on both sides of the wonderful River Nile. In it were many great cities, and from one end of it to the other there were broad fields of grain and fine pastures for sheep and cattle. The people of Egypt were very proud, for they believed that they were the first and oldest of all nations. It was in our country that the first men and women lived. They said, all the people of the world were once Egyptians. 
a king of Egypt, whose name was Psammeticus, footnote op Psammeticus pro, Psammeticus, wished to make sure whether this was true or not. How could he find out? He tried first one plan and then another, but none of them proved anything at all. Then he called his wisest men together and asked them, Is it really true that the first people in the world were Egyptians? They answered, We cannot tell you, O king, for none of our histories go back so far. Then Psammeticus tried still another plan. He sent out among the poor people of the city and found two little babies who had never heard a word spoken. He gave these to a shepherd and ordered him to bring them up among his sheep, far from the homes of men. You must never speak a word to them, said the king, and you must not permit any person to speak in their hearing. The shepherd did as he was bidden. He took the children far away to a green valley where his flocks were feeding. There he cared for them with love and kindness, but no word did he speak in their hearing. They grew up healthy and strong. They played with the lambs in the field and saw no human being but the shepherd. Thus two or three years went by. Then, one evening when the shepherd came home from a visit to the city, he was delighted to see the children running out to meet him. They held up their hands, as though asking for something, and cried out, Because, because, because. The shepherd led them gently back to the hut and gave them their usual supper of bread and milk. He said nothing to them but wondered where they had heard the strange word because, and what was its meaning. After that, whenever the children were hungry, they cried out, because, 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 till the shepherd gave them something to eat. Some time later, the shepherd went to the city and told the king that the children had learned to speak one word, but how or from whom, he did not know. What is that word? asked the king. Because. Then the king called one of the wisest scholars in Egypt and asked him what the word meant. Because, said the wise man, is a Phrygian footnote, Phrygian pro, Phrygian, word, and it means bread. Then what shall we understand by these children being able to speak a Phrygian word which they have never heard from other lips? Asked the king. We are to understand that the Phrygian language was the first of all languages, was the answer. These children are learning it just as the first people who lived on the earth learned it in the beginning. Therefore, Said the king, must we conclude that the Phrygians were the first and oldest of all the nations? Certainly, answered the wise man. And from that time the Egyptians always spoke of the Phrygians as being of an older race than themselves. This was an odd way of proving something, for, as every one can readily see, it proved nothing. Wolf, wolf, wolf. Three farmers were walking across a field and looking eagerly for tracks in the soft ground. One carried a gun, one had a pitchfork, and the third had an axe. Wolf, wolf, wolf. They cried as they met another farmer coming over the hill. Where, where, he asked. We don't know was the answer, but we saw her tracks down there by the brook.
It's the same old wolf that has been skulking around here all winter. She killed three of my lambs last night, said the one whose name was David Brown. She's killed as many as twenty since the winter began, said Thomas Tanner. How do you know that it is only one beast that does all this mischief? Asked the fourth farmer, whose name was Israel Putnam. Because the tracks are always the same, answered David Brown. They show that three toes have been lost from the left forefoot. She's been caught in a trap sometime, I guess, said Putnam. Samuel Stark saw her the other morning, said Tanner. He says she was a monster, and she was running straight toward the hills with a little lamb in her mouth. They say she has a family of young wolves up there, and that is why she kills so many lambs. Here are the tracks again said Putnam. They could be seen very plainly, for here the ground was quite muddy. The four men followed them for some distance, and then lost them on the hillside. Let us call the neighbors together and have a grand wolf hunt tomorrow, said Putnam. We must put an end to this killing of lambs. All the other men agreed to this, and they parted. The next day twenty men and boys came together for the grand wolf hunt. They tracked the beast to the mouth of a cave, far up on the hills. They shouted and threw stones into the cave, but the wolf was too wise to show herself. She lay hidden among some rocks, and nothing could make her stir. I will fetch her out, said Disreel Putnam. The opening to the cave was only an arrow hole between two rocks. Putnam stooped down and looked in. It was very dark there, and he could not see anything. Then he tied a rope around his waist and said to his friends, Take hold of the other end, boys. When I jerk it, then pull me out as quickly as you can. He got down on his hands and knees and crawled into the cave. He crawled very slowly and carefully. At last he saw something in the darkness that looked like two balls of fire. He knew that these were the eyes of the wolf. The wolf gave a low growl and made ready to meet him. Putnam gave the rope a quick jerk and his friends pulled him out in great haste. They feared that the wolf was upon him, but he wished only to get his gun. Soon, with the gun in one hand, he crept back into the cave. The wolf saw him. She growled so loudly that the men and boys outside were frightened. But Putnam was not afraid. He raised his gun and fired at the great beast. When his friends heard the gun, they pulled the rope quickly and drew him out. It was no fun to be pulled over the sharp stones in that way, but it was better than to be bitten by the wolf. Putnam loaded his gun again. Then he listened. There was not a sound inside of the cave. Perhaps the wolf was waiting to spring upon him. He crept into the cave for the third time. There were no balls of fire to be seen now. No angry growl was heard. The wolf was dead. Putnam stayed in the cave so long that his friends began to be alarmed. After a while, however, he gave the rope a quick jerk. Men and boys pulled with all their might and Putnam and the wolf were drawn out together. This happened when Israel Putnam was a young man. When the Revolutionary War began, he was one of the first to hurry to Boston to help the people defend themselves against the British soldiers.
He became famous as one of the bravest and best of the generals who fought to make our country free. One day the caliph, Har al -Nau Rashid, made a great feast. The feast was held in the grandest room of the palace. The walls and ceiling glittered with gold and precious gems. The table was decorated with rare and beautiful plants and flowers. All the noblest men of Persia and Arabia were there. Many wise men and poets and musicians had also been invited. In the midst of the feast, the caliph called upon the poet, Abulatea, and said, O prince of verse makers, show us thy skill. Describe in verse this glad and glorious feast. The poet rose and began, Live, O caliph, and enjoy thyself in the shelter of thy lofty palace. That is a good beginning, said Rashid. Let us hear the rest. The poet went on a may each morning bring thee some new joy. May each evening see that all thy wishes have been performed. Good, good, said the caliph, go on. The poet bowed his head and obeyed. But when the hour of death comes, O my caliph, then alas, thou wilt learn that all thy delights were but a shadow. The caliph's eyes were filled with tears. Emotion choked him. He covered his face and wept. Then one of the officers, who was sitting near the poet, cried out, Stop. The caliph wished you to amuse him with pleasant thoughts, and you have filled his mind with melancholy. Let the poet alone, said Rashid. He has seen me in my blindness and is trying to open my eyes. Har al al Rashid Aaron the Just was the greatest of all the caliphs of Baghdad. In a wonderful book called The Arabian Nights, there are many interesting stories about him.